Hello everyone and welcome to week three of the Food System Seminar for Winter 2021. We have a theme of food supply chains during the COVID-19 pandemic and I am so pleased to be with you all this important week in the United States where we are beginning a new presidency which has already been announcing key positions that will impact American agriculture including food supply chains and the food system overall. So I encourage you to pay attention to the news, the appointments, some new faces, some old faces, and uh, any early focus areas of the new government as they relate to food systems, food security, agriculture, and the food supply chain overall. Full disclosure, I am recording this the day before our in the inauguration, so my information may be a little out of date, so I'm keeping it general. But happy inauguration week to all and we'll get back to the seminar. So here we are back with our conceptual frameworks on food systems. On the left, we have the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations depiction. And on the right, we have the Nourish Food System Map. For this seminar, you, as you know, we're focusing on the food supply chain, but this week we'll turn our attention to production systems. And we'll use the example of eggs in particular. And I will have the great honor of introducing our expert guest speaker in just a few minutes. Um, but first I'll give just a little bit more of an introduction. So we have already discussed that food systems are interconnected, complex and nonlinear, that there are multiple feedback, feedback loops that influence food supply chains. And these include environmental and economic drivers as well as social, cultural and political ones. But what about the values that drive the drivers? So here we are back at the FAO depiction, the Food and Agriculture Organization depiction. And at the bottom here is a reference to the Sustainable Development Goals with the purple arrow over here. Um, these 17 Global Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs are, are the ones that the global community have decided should be driving the drivers, informing why and even how we proceed, how food and agriculture relate to each of these global agendas. And as you can see here, they do. So each one of these 17 global goals um, have been re-articulated with food and agriculture at their center. Um, so for example, life on land relates to how we farm, whether there's biodiversity on our farms, how we, um, how we focus and how we use our, how we manage our water systems will depend on um, our production practices and will result hopefully in clean water for everyone. So each one of these global development goals can be reframed as a food and agriculture agenda. And I encourage you to dig into these. We'll have a chance to talk about these in more detail next week when we turn our attention to the global food system. But these global agenda, uh, global development goals are also very relevant at the local and regional scale, which is our focus this week. And so here we have a food system model that I don't think we've yet looked at in the seminar, but this one explicitly connects the food supply chain, which is the inner green circle on the left, with the value, with specific stated and articulated values, the inner green circle on the right, that connect to desired outcomes. So for example, biodiversity, clean water, just working conditions, animal welfare. So the articulated values here, as you can see, are that food systems for community and re regional sustainable frameworks be place-based, just, healthy, prosperous, and sustainable. We might now, after we have uh, had experience moving through a great shock like COVID-19, add resilient to that list in both the short and the long term. So today we're going to hear from a local producer who, um, whose work really intersects with some of these values and um, we'll get to hear how some of these values are actually driving the drivers of their local and regional business now and as we move into a post-COVID future. Before I introduce our guest speaker though, I'll remind you that you have another opportunity to submit a reflection via Canvas quiz 
after the seminar. It's due on Tuesday, January 26th. And as last week, we'll invite you to share what you've learned, what surprised you, what made you curious to watch and learn more, what concerns you, um, as well as any questions that remain for you. And so we've tweaked the instructions a little bit based on your feedback this past week. So please review carefully, but also recall this is not meant to be stressful. It's really meant to be a space for you to capture what you're learning and what questions remain for you. And with that, I get to turn my attention to introducing our guest speaker for today, who will speak on the power of local food systems, why you and I should be buying better eggs. Um, I added the and I part. <laughs> um, and our speaker is Donnie Wilcox, who is part of the fifth generation of family farmers and who is the supply chain manager and sustainability lead at Wilcox Family Farms. Wilcox Family Farms is a 110 year old egg farm based out of Roy, Washington. And Donnie grew up feeding dairy calves, packing eggs, running irrigation line, but then he also attended Foster School of Business at the University of Washington, graduating with a BA in finance and entrepreneurship in 2014. After a few years, five years at Amazon, Donnie has returned to his family business in, just in 2019 to pursue his passion for local business and sustainable farming. His latest passion is around the concept of regenerative agriculture and how to create a system of egg production that scales to commercial size while also regenerating the land it uses. It's a personal goal to be able to create and market the first net carbon zero egg within the next year or two. Donnie, I'm so grateful that you are taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us today and to be part of the seminar. Welcome and thank you so much. Well, thank you for, for the introduction and, and thanks for the opportunity to, to tell my story. Um, 2020 was obviously a crazy year for everybody. Uh, I think we can pretty much all agree that for the most part it sucked. Um, and what I'm gonna kind of talk about today, first of all, is I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story. I don't think anything I say will make sense unless I spend some time telling you a little bit of, telling you a little bit about Wilcox, kind of our story uh, and, and where we come from. Um, then once I've kind of told you a little bit about how we came to where we are, I'll talk about food systems. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of the in, industrial food systems is very, very large food systems that we don't really do. Um, and I'll use that to compare to the, the supply chain that at Wilcox Farms we've come up with and kind of show you where it's a little bit different and where it's similar. Um, so once I've kind of set the stage for how our system has evolved and industrial systems have evolved, uh, then I'll focus in really heavily on 2020. Um, and we'll kind of go through a few different parts of the year and explain how our system was impacted by by COVID and how we reacted and adapted and, and ultimately overcame those kind of system shocks. Uh, and then finally at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the trends and, and consumer buying behaviors that we've seen in the last few months. And you know, some of them I think are really good. And I want to talk a little bit about them because I think they actually are thing, some of the few things from 2020 that we should keep. So first of all, uh, just to give you guys a little bit of background, Wilcox Farms, uh, we're, we're, our, our primary farm is in Roy, Washington. It's 60 miles or so south of Seattle. Uh, we were founded in 1909 by my great-great-grandfather Judson. Um, the, the family story is, he, uh, you can actually see it in the picture on the left there. He had a hat shop and a house on Queen Anne in Seattle. And he, uh, he went down for kind of like a work vacation to the farm. In Roy uh, for like a week and he just fell in love with the place and he he convinced the farmer who owned the farm to trade it for his house and and shop in Queen Anne traded it for the farm uh, and then he went home and, and did the best sales job in the world on his wife and convinced her to come with him um, so that was kind of how how the Wilcox family got started in farming uh, and for the first you know 10 years or something they're kind of a survival farm like most farms were in the early 1900s they had a couple cows, a few chickens and a goat, things like that. Um, but once they, they had three kids and they were getting a little bit older, they said, hey, you know, we actually want to be able to send our kids to college. Uh, and so Judson and, and Betty Wilcox, they, they took turns going to poultry school at Wazoo and Piala. Um, and after that, they got their first flock of, of chickens. 
I think it was like 300 or something, which was, you know, a full size flock in like 1919. Um, and so that was how Wilcox really got into the egg business. Uh, and for the next, you know, 80 years or so, uh, that kind of egg business slowly grew. And in the, you know, as kind of a normal commercial egg company, uh, sometime around the 50s is when uh, the industry started scaling up a lot more quickly. So you can see the, the top right picture there. That's from like the 1950s. Um, and those big buildings, those are state of the art, like three story tall uh, industrial chicken houses. Um, and at the time they were some of the largest ones in, in Washington. Uh, and that was kind of us, that was Wilcox getting into kind of a large scale egg farming. Um, as you can see, you know, it, it took a little bit for all the chickens to end up in cages as kind of the industry moved there. Um, but that was kind of fifties and sixties where industri industrial egg farming went. Um, you can actually see my, my grandfather is the bottom right kid there. And so that was kind of, Wilcox Farms for all the way up until the, the early 2000s. Um, that was how you farmed, that was how you raised chickens. Um, and around around 2001 is when, uh, really it was the generation before mine, so my cousins Brent and Andy, they came back to the, the family business and they, uh, they, they made the bold claim of telling their dad, you know, the way you've been farming your whole life, we don't want to do that and we don't think it's right. Um, you know, they were, they pretty much came in with the, with the ideology that we don't think that having birds in captivity is the right way to do it. And we see where the industry is going um, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and we want to, if, if we want to stay in the egg business and still be farmers, we think we have to figure out a different way to do it. Uh, and it took them uh, a couple of years to kind of convince uh, the rest of the family that it was, you know, a viable business. Um, but in, in around 2001, we committed to, or we, we put in our first cage-free chicken house and we pretty much started the very long process of transitioning our whole company from this kind of industrial low cost producer to a, a value added producer. Uh, and so we spent, you know, it's, it takes decades and a ton of capital to rip cages out of, out of houses and, and put in cage-free and organic. And um, the whole time we were doing that, uh, we were looking at what's going on in Europe because they've always been kind of like a decade ahead of us. And uh, they were looking at, as, as we were putting in cage-free, they were looking at pasture-raised. And so just as soon as we were getting into cage-free, we're, we're continuing to push that envelope. And really what, what that has, what that, the, the goal, the dream there is uh, we don't think that it's right that birds are kept in captivity. We don't think that's the right way to farm if we want to have a sustainable system. Um, and the way we think it should be done is, is birds should live outside. Uh, you know, they should live the way birds live, have the five freedoms, all of that. Um, and so it's been kind of a 20 year process to go from the, the picture on the left um, to the one on the right, which is, uh, you know, chickens spend their lives outside, they're in the sun. Um, and to do that, it, it became obvious very quickly that you can't do that and also be this massive scale producer that produces eggs at the super, super low cost, uh, which is where the industry was going. While we were going cage free and organic, the industry was getting bigger and bigger, more and more consolidated. Uh, the cages were getting smaller, the bird numbers were getting bigger. Uh, and so we really had to figure out what's a totally different food system, a totally different way to organize our business in a way that's more local, more sustainable, and, and we think has better outcomes for, for animals and people. So that's kind of the, the really brief story of how we kind of got to being the Wilcox Farms that we are today. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about supply chains uh, and, and compare the, the industrial to the Wilcox. So this is a graphic from Sodexo. So it, it really gives you an idea of how the, the industrial supply chain for eggs works. And I like it because it shows just the ridiculous scale. It's actually a few years old. Nowadays, there's something like 350 million laying hens in the United States. Um, and most of the eggs all go to retail and the rest go to, they're called breaker eggs. So they go into food service for the most part where the eggs get broken and they turn into, you know, 
liquid eggs for restaurants and things like that. Um, the important thing here is to do this kind of scale, what, what industrial egg farms are is they have these gigantic buildings, literally like a million chickens in one building. Um, and all the eggs come down the line and they get packed into a giant machine that does literally just two things. It packs, you know, one dozen or maybe one dozen and 18 pack large white eggs into a package. And then the, and then anything that isn't perfect, you know, it's not large or extra large. It has any kind of dirt or stain or any cracks, whatever that goes all into breakers. And so they do that on just this absolutely massive scale to get the absolute lowest cost possible. <laughs> and then what happens is the, if you want to have that absolute lowest cost possible and these giant scale, you can't, you, you have to have all of your production in one spot so you can do it as cheaply as possible. So then they, they run all those eggs out, they load them onto trucks and they send them, you know, mostly from the, most of the birds in the U.S. are in the Midwest. And they load them on trucks and they send them 2,000 miles uh, up, to, up to the Northwest for you to buy them at Walmart. And that's kind of the, the way that conventional eggs make it to market and, and pretty much any low cost egg. Uh, since we weren't willing to go to that scale where we would put a million birds into one giant house and, and you know, do things at that cheap level, we had to come up with a different way to do it. And what we came up with is essentially the exact opposite. Um, instead of having one giant building that houses all my chickens, I have, I have dozens of chicken houses kind of spread out all over the Northwest. Um, and the idea there is I can provide eggs that have a better value by having them closer to the communities they serve. So uh, I have chickens in Oregon that provide eggs to customers in Oregon, Was same, with or or same with Washington, Montana, I buy crops from farmers in the Northwest as much as I can. I sell them manure back to fertilize their fields. Uh, I raise the baby chicks in, in the same states. And so we have kind of the exact opposite system where my goal is to be as local as possible and as sustainable as possible. Um, so instead of, you know, one, one small plot with a ton of chickens, I have a lot of, a lot of room for all of those chickens and I do it as best I can. The other thing is, uh, if I'm going to do it in kind of this small scale, I can't just do one thing really, really well. You know, I can't have all of my chicken houses making one dozen large white eggs. I have to do all of the things, all of the different egg products for my region. So I'm essentially, instead of being a product focused company where I try and do one product really cheaply, I try and do all the products as high quality as I possibly can. And so that led us to this system where we're not at all specialized. We're actually Kind of a jack of all trades. So I want to serve the customers in the Northwest who are looking for eggs that reflect their values, be that organic or pasture raised or cage free or, or things like that. And then I'll serve them any kind of egg product they want. So going into 2020, my business was pretty evenly split between retail and food service. So, uh, you know, you can see like in the bottom left, that's a retail pasture raised, sells in Kroger. But then I also do a lot of hard boiled eggs. Um, which would go in, you know, places like Costco and a lot of like corporate cafeterias, like Microsoft Campus had them, things like that. And then food service, so like your bulk shell eggs, your liquid eggs, uh, and kind of the bulk hard boiled eggs. So we kind of do all of the different egg products at kind of our Wilcox higher value. Uh, and so that's our focus is our focus is to do as good of a job as we can in the Northwest. So that it kind of gives you an idea of what the Wilcox system looks like and kind of how the large scale industrial system looks like. Now that I've kind of explained how those work, uh, I'm gonna spend most of the rest of the time talking about 2020 and kind of how our system and, and, and industrial systems reacted to the shocks caused by COVID. So you guys all, for the most part, know what happened. Um, but in case you forgot, I put some uh, some headlines in there. Um, for us, really, there was kind of a few different waves of system shocks, uh, and I'll go through each one. So the first one is, you know, right at kind of the second weekend in March uh, was when, like, in Washington State and the Northwest, kind of lockdown started going. People realized, like, oh man, this is like this is a big deal. Uh, 
And so the first thing was retail demand just went crazy. That's your panic buying. That was when your toilet paper went out of stock. Uh, and every every retail customer I had was suddenly wiped out of eggs, called me on the phone, you know, instead of ordering one pallet, they were ordering 10. Um, just kind of madness there. And as, as system shocks go, that one's actually not that bad because it's really do the things you do faster. Um, so, you know, run the trucks twice, run your plant longer. Like it's all the things that we knew how to do. We just had to do them longer and faster. Uh, the second wave was a lot more challenging. And that's the other half of my business, the food service business. Uh, and that's where things kind of started to break. Basically, all of my food service customers, they're mostly kind of your big distributors like Cisco and US Foods and stuff. Uh, they started calling saying, hey, every PO you have from us, cancel it. We're not taking any more product. None of it's going out. I had trucks like on the road uh, to Northern California and stuff where they got to the warehouse and they said, nope, we're not taking it, go home. Um, which you can't really do with a finished product. So uh, that was just wild. And then the other thing was, uh, I have two full plants, a liquid plant, hard boiled plant, suddenly have nothing to do. I have employees with nothing for them to run. And I have all those raw materials, you know, like I showed you on that industrial supply chain, 35, not quite 35% for me, but something like 15% of my eggs are not going into retail packages. And now they have no home. Um, and those are, they're building up quick because I'm running so many of my eggs. Um, and so that was, you know, that's where you kind of got to the, the point and, and the industrial supply chain has the same problem where you have all these eggs and you don't have anything to do with them. You know, if, if the eggs have crack, if the eggs have cracks in them or they're stained or something, I can't put them into a retail package. Uh, and that's, you know, dairy farmers have the same problem where they had milk, didn't know where to go with it. And, you know, they started dumping it down the drain. And we got kind of to the same breaking point where we we had truckloads of eggs nowhere to go. And we, we kind of had a meeting. We, we, we ignored it as long as we could. And then we said, hey, these eggs are getting old. We got to do something with them. And so we had a meeting. And we said, hey, what are we going to do? And at the end of the day, really, what none of us could look each other in the eye and say, yep, we're going to back a semi truck up to the compost pile and push the whole thing in. Um, we just we couldn't we couldn't do it when, you know, there was crazy lines at, at, at the food banks and, you know, there was food insecurity. Uh, and so even though it costs us a, a ton of money to run our plant um, and, and the materials and stuff, we ended up uh, actually giving it all away for free. Um, you know, some of the government money ended up paying for the labor, but not, you know, the, the plant costs and the packaging and stuff. Um, and so we ended up giving away something like a million servings of eggs. Uh, and I think, you know, part of that is when you have a local food system, uh, I'm not in Iowa where there's, you know, a thousand people in, in the next hundred miles. Like I'm 60 miles from Seattle. I farms right next to Portland. Like if my whole business is based around this, you know, my region and my communities, like, it, I mean, I have to support them. Like I don't, I don't really, that's, that's who I am. Um, so we ended up, running our plant and, and donating a ton of products. But obviously like, you know, that was a good way to work through kind of this buildup. But once it became obvious that, you know, COVID wasn't gonna be like a three week thing, um, it was gonna stick around for a while. We had to figure out how do we adapt our supply chain and our business to kind of work through the new, the new paradigm that we're in. Um, and that kind of tied into uh, the kind of the third system shock, which was after about three weeks, uh, I started to run out of stuff. I ran out of eggs that could go into retail um, because I had, you know, in February is a slow time of year. So I had inventory built up for March. But by the end of the March, by the end of March, it was all gone. I had no more large and extra large eggs. Um, and I ran out of cartons. Uh, you know, carton companies are, are very large industrial and they can, you know, they can do that because they don't abuse birds, you know, don't abuse animals to do it. Um, but <laughs> They, you know, they do things at full speed and they don't really have ways to adapt. So I had cartons for eight weeks that were gone in two and I was, there's no way I was going to get more cartons until eight weeks. Um, and so we had to figure out how do we adapt to use these eggs that can't go into food service? And also how do we keep our customers in stock when I don't have cartons? Um, and so that's one area where being a more flexible company really saved us. Uh, 
you know, since my, my, my eggs are all actually collected offline, like in the chicken houses and brought to a processing plant, uh, my processing plant is way more flexible than one where a million eggs go down the line into one package and can only do one thing. Um, for those guys, it costs them a million dollars of capital investment to bring in a new machine that can do anything other than one dozen large eggs. Um, so we ended up going to our customers and saying, hey, I can't give you the, the product you've been buying because I don't have any more eggs or cartons, but I want to give you any eggs I can because you don't have any eggs on your shelf. Like, how can we help? Uh, and so that's where we were able to get we were able to get flexible and we started selling like eggs on those fiber flats on the left there. Um, you know, that's just 30 eggs. I put a, I put a label like on the right, that's literally a label I was printing off of my printer here. Um, and you might've gone to Costco and bought those it was kind of an absurd seven and a half dozen pack, um, of medium eggs because medium eggs normally all go to hard boiled, but now I had no home for them, uh, for the breaker eggs, uh, you know, customers don't normally buy liquid eggs in a retail package. Uh, normally that's all food service, but we've tried it. So I had old quart cartons that we were able to dig up and, and we ran our breaker eggs into quarts and we said, Hey, I can't necessarily give you eggs with, you know, a, a, that, that are the eggs you normally buy, but I can give you a liquid egg. Or uh, the other source of breaker eggs is eggs that are really huge or really, really tiny. Um, and the same with the trays, you know, I could say, Hey, I've got, you know, every, it was literally every day I'd call a customer and be like, Hey, I've got 300 dozen super jumbo eggs can I put those on a tray and send those to you? Uh, and so that was kind of how we just got really scrappy and really flexible uh, to get through. It was about March through through May, uh, which is kind of where we saw all these crazy peaks and panic buying and and changes like every week to, to lockdowns. Um, once we got to about June is where kind of toilet paper got in stock and, and the eggs, you know, the supply food supply chains had kind of adapted to, to figure out how do we, you know, get all the eggs we need to the right places. Um, so that's where we kind of got into, I kind of think of it as like the lockdown lifestyle or lockdown paradigm because things really settled out and everyone figured out how to live when you don't do anything. <laughs> So obviously re the retail versus food service part was still there. Uh, you know, food service still doesn't really exist. Um, and retail is still really big, but there's kind of a few other things that we've seen that, that I think are really interesting and they're important, I think. Um, the first one is customers are buying very different things. Like it's not like all the things that sold into food service, customers started buying those in retail. Um, some of them are easy to explain, like instead of doing recreation or eating out, people are indulging by buying fancy or chocolate. Like that's a pretty easy one to explain. It's disposable income that customers decide to treat themselves with food rather than treating themselves with, you know, an experience. But what I think is, is really interesting is not only is it, you know, the indulgent things, but also you're seeing that the, the kind of new purchases to retail skew really heavily towards healthier more ethical and more premium. And when you kind of dive into some of the research around this, what, what you kind of learn is when, when you buy food at like a restaurant or in a cafeteria or something, you're really, you're choosing how do you want your food to be prepared for the most part? Like, do I want an omelet with these toppings? Do I want to scramble with these things in it? And, you know, eggs are just an ingredient. Whereas when you order in retail, when you buy food in retail, you're actually choosing which eggs do I want, not how do I want them prepared. And when customers are kind of forced to make that choice of which eggs do I want, which coffee do I want, overwhelming, well, not overwhelming, but at a much higher rate than before COVID, customers are saying, I'm going to choose the coffee that comes from farmers who are paid fairly. Um, rather than just getting a coffee, they're saying, this is a coffee I want. Same with eggs. Rather than just saying, I'm going to get, I'm going to eat eggs for breakfast. They're saying, I want to eat eggs from a company that treats their birds ethically. And I don't necessarily, and, and, you know, I know a lot of things about 2020 weren't good, but that's something that I think is really awesome. And I hope that we can keep that going into next year. Um, you know, I think the idea that you need to choose what food you eat more than in terms of, you know, what values does that food reflect is something that has really gained a lot of focus in 2020. And 
uh, it's something that I'm really passionate about, but I hope that, you know, everybody else can uh, keep that going into 2020 and, and think a little bit more about the food they're buying. So that's kind of the, the that's what I have for you guys. Um, I hope it was educational and thank you for your time. Donnie, thank you so much. I wish that I could emulate the 300 students who are signed up for the seminar to actually express the appreciation and the applause that you would be hearing if we were in person. Um, that was, you covered so much in that talk. And so I just wanna first acknowledge what an incredibly challenging year this has been for you and your family and your family's business. And what um, an incredible story of both the the impacts, but also the adaptations that you have managed to weather and, and are working to overcome um, now and in, and in the time ahead. So thank you for sharing that story, dating back five generations and into the chaos of today. Um, and also some of the, the, uh, the paradoxes that exist, you know, because so what we've been talking about in class is also um, the segment, of course, of the population of the American population who is facing greater food insecurity and who is underemployed or unemployed. Um, and then, of course, there is this other extreme that there is more disposable income that people are spending on food. And that part is really fascinating that it's spending on food, not in more um, gourmet food choices at fancy restaurants, but rather at the grocery store. So it's fascinating to think about um, how those with purchasing power are, are choosing to use it. And I really appreciate your sentiments of wanting to see that carry forward. So I have, a, I have so many questions for you, but I wanna start with one that I feel like a lot of students might be interested in. Um, and that is you know, the story that you shared with us at the beginning of your family's transition from kind of industrial agriculture to cage-free organic agriculture and experimenting really with these uh, more, um, more ecologically based agriculture as I, as I see it. Um, it seemed to me that you were sharing some incredible successes that your family has had around these practices and there's been growth over time in these practices. So the question is why don't more poultry producers adopt some of these practices? And do you see that as being a, a growth industry or is there potential to grow your family's approach throughout the poultry business over time? Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, there's there's a few reasons why. Yeah, I think part of it is the, the industry is moving towards cage-free, um, mostly, you know, driven by really good work at the Humane Society and ballot initiatives and, and things like that. Um, so the industry's going there, but the biggest thing is it's it's mostly a matter of inertia. You know, these we kind of had the opportunity to choose not to get really big before we had millions upon millions of dollars of capital invested in being really big. Um, you, at the end of the day, you can't farm, you, you can't raise chickens the way at the cost that people need, at the cost that people do it right now in cages. Um, and so there's a ton of resistance in the industry to, to moving to cage free and organic and things like that, because there's so much capital tied up in the existing uh, system. Um, and so it's just a matter of, you know, we wanted to stay ahead of kind of customer preferences. Uh, and if you're already the biggest guy in the market and already doing it the cheapest, um, you don't want to have to spend a lot of capital to upgrade your systems or build new barns. Um, and so that's, that's probably the biggest reason why other people don't want to move there. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, and I also really appreciated you talking about your... Um, your scrappiness and flexibility, you know, the fact that you were able to do that because of the scale and size that you operate at, at you know, even to, to accommodate or to respond to the pandemic shocks. So my next question, um, again, channeling students is what happens, um, what do you recommend, if anything, to consumers who would like to support eggs like the ones that you produce in the various products that you produce and who also see you know the price difference that you spoke about between the industrial industrially produced eggs and um wilcox family farms eggs and so how how do you speak to consumers or potential consumers about that yeah um obviously 
buying Wilcox eggs is really helpful for Wilcox. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's a big part, but, um, you know, what has really, what's driven that when I say the industry is slowly moving towards cage free, uh, the reason it's doing that is not because the industry wants to, um, it's really entirely driven by advocacy. Um, so the humane society, we've worked with them. They worked with us like hand in hand when we first put in cage free. Um, and so, you know, they're a great example where they said, Hey, we're going to, customers want cage free, even if the industry doesn't. Um, and the reason why they've been successful is because they have had incredible amounts of advocacy at the state level, at the grassroots level, um, and, you know, kind of driving towards better animal welfare standards. And I think what you're starting to see now and where, you know, we see a lot of interest is uh, not just animal welfare, but also kind of what you talked about is all the other environmental and, and external factors, um, you know, we want to make sure that that the eggs we produce are doing the right thing for the land they're produced on and um, the global climate and things like that. Uh, and obviously, like, like I said, the way I farm, I can't do it at the low cost that, uh, that, you know, the, 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 the industrial farmers can. Um, and, you know, not everybody can necessarily afford to, to pay more for food. Um, but that's that's okay because advocacy still counts for a lot and even cage free eggs you know when we first started doing it the technology was brand new and it costs a lot more and even in the last 15 20 years the costs have come down a lot um and so cage free eggs you can get them at costco are pretty much the same prices as caged in some cases um if you kind of go to the right you know go to some stores and in just a couple of years washington is going to be all cage free anyway but um you know, that's, if you can't afford to buy, you know, more ethical eggs, advocacy still counts for a lot. Um, one of the areas that we've actually had a, a ton of success was, you know, before COVID was food service. Um, and what what really helps there is is a lot of like, you know, if you're the, the buyer for Microsoft, you're not in the business of making money off of food. Uh, so they're actually, they're in the business of, you know, making sure that their employees are getting the food that they want. Um, and so, you know, they, they buy Wilcox eggs because that's what their employees want. Um, and they're not, you know, profit isn't the only thing that matters to them. Thank you. That's such an, a helpful overview, both of the ways that advocacy has impacted the business, but also the fact that it's, an, it's ongoing and there, there are ongoing opportunities to engage in that. And of course, it's not, you know, it's a plug for Wilcox because I, you know, you're, you're a guest and it's really exciting to learn about your business, but it's also a, a plug more for thinking about um, the values that you're speaking about in your family's business and the values that we know can infuse community and regional food systems at the fore of, of uh, many different food supply chains, eggs being one of the examples. So I think that's a, you know, a great place to, to end with lots to think about both in terms of what we as individuals can do, what uh, you as a farmer and as a member of our, as a leader of our, uh, within our food supply chain here in Washington state and in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I, again, I really appreciate the time that you spent to come and tell your family's story and then also share with us some of the real challenges of the last year, but also some of the uh, perseverance and resilience that you and your family are showing. So thank you so much for your time. Students, really looking forward to your reflections um, after this. Again, details are on Canvas and your, your assignment is due, or your Canvas quiz rather, is due on Tuesday. And I think it'll be really, um, really important and informative to keep Donnie's presentation in mind also as next week we transition into more of a global food system perspective. So have a good weekend, um, take care. And Donnie, thank you again for your time. It was great to host you. Thank you.